All right, welcome everyone. Hello and happy Friday. You are watching 7 Gen Live and thank you all for tuning in today. My name is Jillian Wan and I'm here with my co-host Mike Prey and on today's episode we're discussing community-based schools with Senator Troy Heiner who is from Mission, South Dakota and Sarah Pierce who's from the Pine Ridge Reservation and she currently serves as Indian Collective's Director of Education Equity. And just jumping right into it here, it's really obvious that there's been an entire demographic that has been really underserved in our current westernized education system. But I'm really happy ha to have the both of you on here today to talk about what is actually being done to change this. Uh, so with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and welcome Senator Troy Heiner on here first. Good morning. Um, actually, good afternoon. How are you today? Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Where are you um, exactly? I'm in my office in the Capitol. Um, I just left the State Affairs Committee and uh, we're going to go to caucus shortly. So I apologize, I can't stay the whole hour, um, but we have floor session early today. So, but I'm here in our state's capital. Great, well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know we're a little short on time here with you, but um, just can you just give everybody an update on the current bill, SB uh, 68, and what, what is going on with that right now? Sure, so SB 68 had its first hearing uh, in Senate Ed yesterday morning. Uh, we took, oh, roughly an hour and a half of testimony. Um, we are in the question and answer phase. Uh, the testifiers, the proponents that came, just knocked it out of the park. Um, you know, they we not only talked about the need and and the direction and and the want uh, of what this bill would do, but you know, we talked about economics and how that changes how education can change our community uh, for the better. Uh, we talked about the history of Native education. So, you know, I think the committee heard a good representation of why this bill is needed. Um, we did ha have some opponents. Uh, I, found, I found some of them uh, a little late to the game. Um, you know, now they're saying, well, we can do this and we wanna do this um, and that we don't need this legislation. Well, if it wasn't for this legislation, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So, um, you know, we're fortunate that the Senate Ed Committee heard last year's bill, Senate Bill 66, which is a mirror. Uh, Senate Bill 68 is a mirror to 66, um, except for one member. We have one new member on our committee. So I think we're in a good place uh, as far as in the education committee. I think we're in a good place as far as the Senate floor. Um, last year, we ran into the trouble in the House, uh, but I think we, we have a plan for that this year. Awesome, thank you for that. I, I think later in the show with Sarah, we'll get into a little bit more of, of the kind of background and reasoning for this. But can you, Troy, can you can you just provide, um, what is the bill? What, what are you all asking for? What, what is it actually hoping to accomplish if, if passed? Sure. So the, the bill is just allowing us a different model of education for native students. Uh, you know, we've, we've seen the, the dropout rates and, and the kids lack of relevance in what they see when they walk into a school building, uh, whether that's through the curriculum that they're being asked to learn or just in uh, how we manage their, their daily lives. And that's, it. that's not everywhere, but obviously um, there, our demographic is the only data set in the whole state that, that shows that you know, we're just not having the successes that that non-Indian counterparts do. And, you know, that that's not our fault, that's a system fault. So we need to change that system. So that's, that's what the bill does. Um, it works with the local school district. Um, you know, those kids would still be counted as, a, you know, a, a local school district student, um, but really just gives us the flexibility focused on language, culture, relevance, uh, to meet the standards and give kids a, a chance to, you know, be who they are within their DNA uh, through their educational process. And Troy, um, for those, so with that last bill, SB 66, 
it seemed like a lot of people were in support of it. As far as people who lived on reservations or they came from other tribes, how would you say that those who are not aware of the native culture, how could they, how could you sway or how can anyone sway them to be in support of this bill SB 68? Well, you know, it, it starts by just having the conversation. Um, I sat down last night for two hours with a set of lobbyists. One was an, uh, an opponent uh, yesterday morning, and he's a he was a he is a South Dakotan. Grew up here, graduated here, went to law school here. Um, is an attorney in southeastern South Dakota, and just had no idea. Um, you know, he he knew that there was a Indian insane asylum in Canton, but he had no frame of reference of its connotations. Um, you know, and that's where he was from. So we just have to have those conversations and explain to, you know, our counterparts or our, our colleagues that, you know, this is a chance. It may not affect their community uh, or their school district or maybe even some kids that, that they think uh, could benefit. But if it changes our community, that has a better chance where our people are able to go out, get jobs, good paying jobs and change our community from within. And that's, uh, that's, a, that's better for our state and our nation. So, you know, we have some work to do, but I'm confident the, the proponents, um, you know, all the people, Sarah and, and Amy and everybody else, uh, you know, they, they've got a good message. They've got a good story. Uh, they've got the data to back that up. And I think we, we have some momentum. One quick question before uh, we turn over to Sarah, just in case you have to drop off, you know, when, when we go that way, what, from your perspective as a, as a member of the legislative body in the state, what, um, what would you wanna see um, tribal members on Rosebud or, or people who are just the everyday people who, who support mm -hmm. this? What, what can people do um, to show their support and, and to uh, help give voice to, to this kind of bill and, and what we're trying to achieve here? Well, the first thing is just be an advocate. Um, you know, reach out to senators. All of our emails are posted. A lot of our phone numbers are posted uh, on the LRC website. Um, you know, you can leave a message here at the Capitol uh, asking for support. If, if you have uh, specific instances, uh, you know, where, where you felt shut out in a school system or it just didn't make sense to you, or maybe you had a, a relative that, you know, you had went through school with that, that had been shut up. You know, we need to tell that story. Um, and I guess my advice is when you when you contact legislators, you know, always put where you're from. You know, I'm your constituent or, uh, you know, I'm from Mission or I'm from Pine Ridge or Rosebud or uh, wherever. Just so it puts it tries to put that personal face on that on that email or however you contact. Um, I am very, very proud of how our people have really become engaged, especially uh, over this topic. Um, you know, we're talking about the future of, of our tribes and, and our nation. Um, that I think the people have really stepped up. You know, obviously we need more. Uh, we're pretty new to this process, but uh, we're figuring it out fast. Awesome. Thank you, Senator. Appreciate the time today and for, for making time to come talk to us. Um, Sarah, I wanted to, to kind of bring you in here. Um, obviously, like powerhouse, tons of experience, tons, tons of awesome ideas and, and uh, work that you've been doing around um, Educational Equity Committee. Um, can you just take a second to introduce yourself to, to all the people listening and give a little background on, on what the Educational Equity Coalition is? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, um, Senator Heinert, for all of the work that you've done um, with this bill this year and last year. I think um, one of the amazing opportunities that I have as a professional in this field is working with um, people like Troy, Senator Troy Heinert, who have a deep-seated investment to communities who have evidenced um, success stories as a practitioner in the field of Indian education. And so um, you are among the predecessors whose shoulders that um, my generation and my colleagues stand on. And so thank you so much for paving that way for us. 
Um, as you said, my name is Sarah Pierce and I am the lead facilitator of the South Dakota Education Equity Coalition. Um, the coalition is a broad based cross sector group of stakeholders committed to champion championing indigenous student success. So it was created in the summer of 2019 with the primary goal of championing what we affectionately know as um, SB 66. And then we've evolved from last year's legislative session to include four additional priority areas, uh, most specifically to elevating the needs of indigenous education in South Dakota. Um, one of our priority areas is the bill. And so um, SB 68 um, is a priority of the five that we have, but we have a, a consistently growing base of coalition membership. Right now, um, we're pretty small, we're at 50 but we just became a lot more formalized this past summer. So it's been really amazing to see. We know that um, the efforts that we're doing aren't um, unique to South Dakota. We know that there's a field of experts and practitioners who have been doing the work um, for generations and we're just creating an opportunity and a convening space so this work can be done um, without people feeling like they're siloed in their efforts. And Sarah, aside from your own personal experience, how do you figure what work needs to be done? Do you get feedback from students, parents, teachers? How does that work? That's a great question. Um, this year, when, when we decided on the five key priority areas, we had actually um, a very intensive strategic planning session in which um, membership at that time was able to convene together. First and foremost, we debriefed the SB 66 process, but then we brought additional practitioners um, that kind of discussed what obstacles are in the way of advocating on behalf of Indigenous students in South Dakota. What similarities are we seeing? What challenges are we um, facing that kind of run in congruence with each other? And so then we were able to determine those areas um, through that process. And then of course, we always um, get feedback from our stakeholders and community members who don't necessarily want to join as a member, but do have really important and integral feedback as we grow and develop as a coalition. Thank you, Senator. We'll see you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Sarah, real quick. I just got a text message asking, um, do you guys have a Facebook page? They want to check it out. <laughs> yes, we most definitely. Facebook is probably the best way to get a hold of the coalition and see what's going on in the updates world. And it's um, SD Education Equity Coalition. And we are on Facebook. And we actually, the most recent updates included um, the SB 68 um, Senate committee hearing that Senator Heiner briefly mentioned, um, but we will be actually entering back into the Senate Education Committee next Tuesday for a final vote to determine whether SB 68 goes to the Senate floor or not. And we're pretty optimistic at this time. That's that's great to hear. Um, tell us, you know, from your perspective, give give us a little bit of background on on, um, you know, for for people who might be watching the show who have kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, in, in, in the existing school systems. Um, how might this this legislation change the opportunities that are that are available for them um, in in their community? Absolutely. So I guess I didn't mention, and I should have prefaced with the fact that aside from my professional role, I am the proud and very blessed mother to parent four sons, all of whom are school age. Um, we reside in Rapid City, South Dakota, um, but all four of my sons attend school virtually through the Oglala Lakota County School District. And so just to go back, um, one of the, since education became um, what I refer to as a compulsory imposition on our people, um, starting from the days of 1868 and going into what we see today, um, our people really haven't had an opportunity to um, choose or have, have an opportunity for school choice. Um, the choice opportunities are even more limited in our urban areas. As a former reservation dwelling student turned urban indigenous, indigenous student advocate, I really see where um, the disparities lie in access to culture and language. Um, COVID-19 posed a huge threat to our society and that, that threat persists. However, what it did in terms of education is create created opportunities for choice. Um, in a state like South Dakota, where we do have open enrollment, um, families in under normal circumstances could have access to any school across the state as long as transportation 
um, access allowed them to get to those other schools. Um, COVID-19 offered a unique advantage in that we were able to transfer from Rapid City to the neighboring Oglala Lakota County School District via virtual option. Um, but then the question becomes what beyond virtual options? So I think right now, one of the biggest highlights or advantages that we have as parents navigating in a COVID world is that the freedom or access to choice that we haven't had before. The question then becomes what after COVID can we do to, to maintain um, that level of consistent access to Lakota language and culture. Um, in the Rapid City School District right now, there are only to my knowledge, um, three different Lakota language programs, all of which are elective courses, and they're not offered equitably at each grade level. And so it's a real challenge for our students to have access to that. And um, as we know, with the Ocheti Shakoin Essential Understandings, that um, we don't currently have a metric designed to assess the level of implementation across our districts or even to what fidelity they're being implemented at this time. And I think that was very tangential, but I think in a nutshell, it encapsulates some of the opportunities we have around advocacy. Well, that's great. I mean, and it sounds like also, uh, maybe I'm wrong in saying this, but what I'm hearing is that the, the idea of school choice already exists in the state and some of what we're kind of talking about is what happens if you live in a community where your choices are, you know, two or three of the lowest performing schools in the entire state. Like that's not much of a, a choice. So this is giving an additional kind of level of saying just because it's in writing now doesn't mean that that actually is what's happening on the ground. Is is that fair to say? That is extremely fair to say. And I think if we take take it a step further, there's a there's a very serious opportunity gap when it comes to exercising choice. If you don't have the financial means, if you don't have the logistical means, or um, you know, even the technical means, you're not going to be able to access it with the same um, opportunity as other people. So that poses a unique challenge as well. And Sarah, right here on the Rosebud Sioux Tribe, we do have a Lakota Immersion School here in Mission. Um, just to clear it up though, for those of us who are pretty new to all this, education discussion. Um, is this bill separate? Is it different from a immersion school? Well, actually, the bill, the the unique aspect, if we just back up and look at SB 68, I just want to clear some of the common misconceptions about the bill language is um, South Dakota is one of five states in the United States that lacks charter school legislation. Um, SB 68 is um, a bill that promotes the creation and funding of, of Ocheti Shakoin community-based schools. To be clear, um, this is a system that would enable us to receive public funding to be innovative and creative in terms of offering public education options for students and grounded in the thought and philosophy of the Ocheti Shakoin. Um, the difference, the primary difference between what a charter school does versus what a community-based school is designed to do is that community-based schools are very much smaller in nature. They're designed um, with the uniqueness of each community in mind with the stakeholders who are on the ground working towards that school design. So for example, in um, a place like Mission, um, where the immersion school could then evolve into applying to become a community-based school, um, if the unique need in that community is an immersion school, then 100% yes, this could evolve into an immersion school. In places where, um, in Rapid City, where maybe um, immersion isn't something that is identified as a strong community need, um, which I'm not saying, I'm just using in hypothetical terms, but um, the school could be designed unique to that need. So if it's um, a, like kind of more of a gradual in introduction into language, that's an option, but immersion is ideally something that that would evolve from these this legislation. Could you could you kind of keep going along the thread of you know we mentioned that um, South Dakota is one of one of five that doesn't have this type of of support built into its its um, laws. How are there other you know indigenous or not states and communities that have that this type of legislation exists and has proven to be successful? What, what are the models out there um, for, for implementing it here in our own state? Um, absolutely, I love that question because it, it really gives us the I, I opportunity to clarify. Um, 
Right now, South Dakota is due to this, the rural nature of our state and the limited um, personnel and financial resources that we have, especially in terms of education. It's really unrealistic to propose blanket legislation in our state at this time. It's just not sustainable or, or viable right now um, as we sit as a state. However, there is not a single demographic of um, students in our state that have um, the test data that is so far behind any other counterpart. Um, so I think right now the unique niche that we have in doing this is being able to really um, exercise our sovereign right to um, designing an education that fits our student needs. Um, and that's going to vary a little bit based on each community, but a very intentional glimpse into what um, Indigenous education could look like um, when all stakeholders are involved. And so I think that's a really unique opportunity. Other states that currently don't have legislation are primarily located within this um, quad state region. And so um, we're seeing the same things in Nebraska, in Wyoming, in North Dakota, things like that. So um, just being able to be very intentional about the focused efforts around holistic education around the whole child um, for our Indigenous students, but while at the same time being very inclusive to anyone with an interest in pursuing this avenue. And I'm sure you covered this and all the answers you already shared, but what is the ultimate goal here? Is it to get everybody to graduate from high school and go to college? What is the ultimate goal? So for me, I think if you ask each one of our stakeholders, as Troy mentioned, um, our coalition and the, the bill process has really been a team effort. Um, we just have a, so many champions of this bill who have come together. Each person's scenario is a little bit different. In my opinion, um, graduation as a form of metric um, for achievement is is an ad, like a really ideal aspect but I think for me is having students who have a very strong sense of cultural identity and a confidence in that right they're unapologetic about their being they know what they want to do in life and they know how they fit um, within the fabric of, of South Dakota. I think, I guess going back a little bit, I like to think I'm super young, even though I'm kind of getting, um, moving up in the generational world. But I think one of the biggest things that I learned um, in my experience is that um, being, feeling like you're a part of the community is a huge, huge factor of um, the confidence in achieving, in achievement. Um, when you think about the, when you think about students who, who don't quite understand their place in a community. Like we all understand our inherent connection to the land. This is um, the land of the Ocheti Shakoin. We're, our indigenous ancestry is here. We have that connection. But when we start getting into larger community spaces, especially in urban settings, that inherent connection to community isn't always there. SB 68 would create an opportunity for especially our urban students to exercise and experience their inherent connection to the fabric of the community that ultimately makes South Dakota what it is today. Um, I think another thing is just being able to see, I, I, I always cringe when I hear um, Indigenous education being referred to in a very deficit mindset, but I think it's not a failure of students and it's not a lack of intellect on our students' parts or our people's part. It's really an opportunity gap that needs that's left unmet. It's a system, when a system in, in entire, fails an entire demographic of people, it is not a reflection or due to lack of advocacy on the people, it's, it's a system failing the people. <laughs> 